I, I was told about it and I had to try it out, so I got really engrossed in it. And it was really clever. They had some great hooks early on in the game, which just kind of like sucked you in to keep, keep trying to figure out how this thing was put together. And then fortunately there was like, you know, other people there to help me out when I got stuck. Uh, so uh, that was, uh, that was my first experience. Um, the original intention, or at least the problem that I was trying to solve was trying to figure out how to get people to play a text adventure game again. Um, because the, uh, parser versions were just too difficult for people and the AI wasn't keeping up with that. Um, and the Sierra Adventures, which actually worked at Sierra for about three years, um, they seemed to have their day and then faded for some reason. Um, and I'm not sure if it was an interface reason or they just became economically unviable because of the competition. Uh, I think about that time the competition started moving to other venues for for games. And um, it, it's, it, that, that whole mess was just kind of disturbing that, you know, adventure games are really fun and and they just weren't seeing any. And this was around 1998, 99, I started thinking about this problem. And I was wondering if I could turn it on their, on its head where before you always had a, um, a verb object um, interface where you would declare what you were doing and to what. Uh, sometimes a little bit more complex. You could say, "I'm doing this with I'm doing this with this on this thing too," um, and I was just wondering if uh, you could turn that around. Where what in, if instead the world reacted to things that you placed in it, um, and those things could be people, they could be objects, and that seemed like a, a something that was so simple that it could go mainstream and. Uh, that's, that's almost a slight on mainstream, but uh, the idea is that they, it, it, in practice, it's really difficult to get um, people to wrap their heads around these, you know, complex concepts that, that, that are games today. So um, that was that was my approach, is that I said, okay, well, I'm going to have a, instead of you in, interacting with the world and feeling more powerful, I was t definitely going to take away some of that power of individual choice and, 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 and action in the game to, in order to see if I could draw more people uh, that would not normally have experienced such a such a game. So the witch's yarn was my first attempt at actually realizing this uh, this concept. And the metaphor that I chose to um, assert was a direct uh, was a theater theatrical metaphor, and you were the director. So you would cue objects and actors into the scenes, and then you'd see the little short scenes play out. And they were kept fairly short, so you'd ever felt like you had to wait through a lot of of, of, um, of um, um, action on the. Uh, on the side of the in the story so going back to the beginning you would um, start a scene with some information about what was going on in that scene and then as the director the, the player you would cue one of the actors to say you take you you take the action and then that character depend that, that actor depending on his character um, would drive the scene toward in a direction that that character wanted to go so the first problem we had was trying to figure out, well, how do you know in advance what they might want to do? And we came up with this idea that you start with very iconic things. Like in The Witch's Yarn, you have to deal with family issues. So like at first, when you're introduced to the icons that you're going to click on to, to cue actors and props, we labeled them with generic terms. So it was like mother, uh, daughter, uh, son, um, you know, uh, familiar for her little, her little witch's familiar. Um, and then later on, as you got to see them interact, you kind of knew who they were more and you knew, got a better feel for the kind of things they might try and do when you cued them. So this is a real different approach and it, it, it worked very well for once we got uh, the description down correctly for the, for the audience. They, you, could take any, you can take anyone and sit them down if they know how to use a mouse. Um, I actually showed my mom how to use a mouse. It took me about took me longer to show her how to use the mouse than her to pick up the game when she knew how to use the mouse. Um, so that was very encouraging. And I, we've seen it over and over again now with the, with the current implementation where people can just sit down and play it. The problem with the game, however, ended up being that text itself is not um, the goal of most people who go to find uh, what, I, what I was targeting was a casual game experience. Uh, they want to have more action, they want to have more object interaction, um, actually kind of a simplified system. But as soon as you start throwing text in and a lot of reading, it's like, well, I didn't really come here to just read a book. 
you know, and, and it was very kind of sad to see that a lot of people just passed because it was text-based. Um, and um, I'm not sure how that's going to change, but um, in my next game, um, it doesn't use that system. It's a very different game, um, but it, has, it does rely greatly on text, except the text is now segmented between little games that you play. So um, according to a more uh, casual game, I don't know, uh, paradigm, I hate to use that word, um, is... If you're going to throw text at a person, you better have some like gameplay in there before between everything you tell them. And so we'll see how, the, how that affects the audience. And maybe they'll be drawn to more story and reading. Uh, the concept of, of having narration in text is really great um, when you can't, can't afford a lot of um, animation in your game or, or settings or scenes or drawings. Um, I'm a very low-budget developer. And... Um, um, having the using text to save me a lot of animation and touch is really great, and I also really enjoy writing it too. So that's why I'm with my current game. Yeah, yeah. I don't think they they see games as being a place where they're going to go specifically to read text. Um, I think in this country there's probably not as many readers as there might be in like Japan or Europe, uh, and that could have an effect as well. Um, just reading for pleasure is just not as, as big in the States as it is. However, the internet might be changing some of that too, um, because it had to get started with text first. And now, of course, we're seeing a lot more video oriented stuff. Um, so I, I'm not sure how that'll play out in the long run, but, um, I think if each game ends up being fun in its own right, text, whether it's there or not, is not, not as important, but it may, we may not see an advance of text as the only entertainment for the mainstream. Um, I'm very pleased that there's a quite a nice, quite a large niche out there of people who do still like reading and interacting with uh, text-based games. And it also we're talking like a limited access crowd too. Not a lot of people had computers, and those who did were probably more likely time likely to actually enjoy reading. Um, uh, you know, they're going to be more educated. I think is in general. Um, and that's just a hunch on my my part. Is that that you had that initial start of the little computers, the homebrew computer club was very specialized. That kind of moved on to a little bit more generic, sort of like MSI and some of those early kits that you built. And then there was like Radio Shack and uh, uh, Spectrum or Sinclair, um, uh, Commodore, all those really early machines. They were still fairly expensive um, for a lot of people. And a lot of the people didn't even know what they'd do with a computer if, if they had one. So it was really probably more of a hobbyist audience and people willing to try and, you know, explore all the interesting things they could do with a computer when they had it. You know, that was one of the reasons I think Myst was such a huge success was it did something so visually stunning that people said, I've got to get that. That just looks great. And then they probably never even played it, you know, and in fact, we're really sure that's the case. I think what I mostly was hearing was that they were, the, the general issue was that it was more of a choose-your-adventure type of game because you, you didn't have more fine-grained control over the, the actual actions of characters in the game. Um, so they, they thought it was more of a choose-your-adventure type of game. And I was fine with that. I, I, I like the choose-your-adventure books. Um, I actually didn't play a lot of them. But it def definitely hit more of a mainstream audience with those books, too. So I, I felt like I was reaching my goal, perhaps, with that design. And then later, um, the whole notion of interactive fiction... Uh, I think it's changed enough. I mean, I think the purists who want their text parsers are perfectly, uh, you know, valid in their in their rationalism in their in their in their um, uh, the, um, uh, perspective uh, opinion, <laughs> um, and that's a, that's really great. I, I I love I would love to to get back and play some of the text adventure game. So you um, played bureaucracy. Oh yeah. Oh, that was definitely the worst game ever designed. Um, it was really funny when you got through it, but it, you just wanted to hit your head against the wall. Um, similar thing with the um, uh, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, too. The puzzle was just so tough. Um, but it wasn't like Bureaucracy where everything just was meant to drive you into frustration. It was written that way. It was all about learning and frustration. It's like, hmm, I'm playing a game where I'm being frustrated on purpose. Oh, <laughs> maybe not the best design choice. Um, I want to make a comment, though, about what she said about um, Infocom. And uh, they're, they're realizing that people weren't finishing the games but still enjoying it. It was that Ken Williams, when I was at Sierra, um, Sierra Online, he, was, he had mentioned at one point that they made more money on their books that help people get through the game than they did on the games themselves.